Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to our sharing on St. John's Gospel. Uh, I now want to go into chapter four, and it's a completely new stage uh, in the ministry of Jesus. It's quite a leap to go from chapter three to chapter four, because in chapter three, we're dealing with the Sanhedrin through Nicodemus, and we're dealing with the Jewish people. In chapter four, we're dealing with the Samaritans, and this is quite a, a surprise. So uh, the heading I want to give to this uh, chapter is that Jesus is offering new life to everyone, to all the world, okay? Um, so as we set out with uh, Jesus to go to Samaria, we have to remember that Jesus is gradually uh, revealing himself. And I want you to notice that uh, the whole dialogue, the last in the uh, chapter three, was with one person, that is Nicodemus, representing the whole Jewish situation. And here it's with one person representing all of Samaria. And in chapter five, it's going to be with one man representing all of that situation as well. So Jesus has been in Judea and he's had very mixed results. Uh, some people believed in him and some people rejected him completely. Uh, they were impressed by the signs. Now, each time we come into an area where we're dealing with the chosen people or the Jewish people, uh, we're going to be hearing all the time that they are impressed by signs. But when you come to the Samaritans, the Samaritans don't ask Jesus for a sign. They accept Jesus as he is. And so the incredible thing is that Samaria becomes a model as to how to receive Jesus. That's a, that's a terrible scandal as far as the Jews are concerned. Some of the people uh, in the Judean areas were also quite hostile to Jesus. And you will expect that Samaria will be hostile, but that is not so. Uh, the amazing thing is that John doesn't deal with Jesus' Galilean ministry. He's gone into Samaria. Where's all the ministry in Galilee? Where's all the miracles in Galilee? The reason why John doesn't do that is that the synoptics have already done it, so he's not going to repeat it. Uh, but we do realise uh, at the very beginning that the Pharisees are on his case and they're not going to leave him alone, just as you, you know from the synoptics as well. So let me read the first few verses for you. When Jesus heard that the Pharisees had found out that he was making and baptising more disciples than John, though in fact it was his disciples that were baptising, not Jesus himself, he left Judea and he went back to Galilee. And this meant that he had to cross Samaria. Now, if you have a map, you'll realise he doesn't have to cross Samaria. He can go up north and across into Galilee. But he decides to take a completely different route that will take him up through Samaria. Uh, it was not a geographical uh, necessity that made Jesus go through Samaria. It was his father's will. And so, again, we have to make sure that we read this uh, on the right level uh, so that we know what's going on. And as soon as we get to Samaria, we're going to meet people who are considered heretics, they're considered unclean, they're considered unfit to come to the temple and so on. What is the Lord doing going there? And it's even more incredible, he's going to have an encounter with a woman. Now, in our modern age, we don't think that that's absolutely outlandish, but in those days it was. 
it was unheard of that a young man, Jesus was only 30, would have a conversation with a woman by herself, uh, whether it was in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. And even if it's out in the open, in the public, everybody would suspect it. Okay, so we have to ask, what is John saying to us? Now, I've tried very hard from the very beginning to tell you that we are saturated in the Old Testament if we have to understand John. So I need to take you back to Genesis and to the realization that uh, there was a couple in Genesis. We met them in chapter two, Adam and Eve, and we met the new couple in chapter two as well, Jesus and Mary. And it was the woman in the first couple that instigated the man to actually bring down the human race. She didn't realize that's what she was doing, but she instigated the man uh, to go against God's will. And so it is important for Jesus to come to uh, the woman and to ask the woman, will she enter into the kingdom of God and will she uh, uh, allow him to take her onto this new level and will she become a missionary to take his message to the ends of the earth? The answer to all those questions is going to be yes. And it's going to come from the most unlikely person you could possibly imagine. Because Jesus is not going to approach a saint. He's going to approach a sinner, a heretic and a woman. And in all of these uh, levels, as far as the Jews are concerned, this woman is a no-go. So we are confronted all the time by that message from Isaiah that God's ways are as different from ours as the heavens are from the earth, okay? Um, I told you already several times that as we go through the gospel, you have to remember what was said before to understand what is being uh, presented now. So we've just come out of chapter three, where uh, Nicodemus was properly born uh, through circumcision and into, into the covenant of Moses. And he had the proper privileges of a son of Abraham. And he had the whole of the scriptures. And he had the privilege of going to the temple. And he had all the advantages. Now the person that Jesus is going to speak to now has none of these advantages. She's not properly born. She doesn't worship in the right temple. She's worshiping in a heretical temple uh, on Mount Gerizim. Uh, the worship that she's giving, she doesn't really know who uh, the God is that she's actually worshipping, although she does worship. Uh, and so there is ignorance of God and confusion of religion. The woman seems to have all the disadvantages on the planet. And it would seem as if God wouldn't waste his time on a person who was going nowhere. And on top of all this, her life was chaotic. She'd been through five husbands. So uh, it seemed that she didn't mind repeating the mistakes she made before. Because each time she would fail with one relationship, she'd go straight into another one. That is quite common, actually. Uh, so her knowledge of God is incomplete. Uh, her experience of uh, the, the scriptures is incomplete because uh, with her people only having the Torah, they don't even have the prophets, so they don't have all the teaching that prepared for the Messiah. Um, so what John is doing is creating a question in our minds. And I keep telling uh, my students that the more questions you ask of the scriptures, the better you will do. Uh, if you can't think of any question, Go and read it again. You should be thinking of questions. And the, the, the question that should be raised in your mind at this point is, are these deprived people in Samaria at a disadvantage with regard to the gift of salvation and to the Messiah? In other words, does God distinguish between the orthodox and the heretical? That's a very important question for religion. And the answer is no on both cases. God does not think the way we think. And God doesn't come to us because we're right. He doesn't come to us because we're holy. He comes to us because we're his. He doesn't save us because there's any advantage on our side. None whatsoever. 
He saves us because we are his. He brought us into being and he wants to give us the fullness of life. Everything is on his side. Um, and the amazing thing is in chapter four, we will meet two people, uh, the Samaritan woman, and we will meet a man who may in fact represent the Gentiles. Uh, and in either case, we are meeting people who are quite open and they will have a personal contact with Jesus and they will make their decisions on that personal contact, not on what anybody else says. And so there is groundwork being uh, made here for all the missionaries who are going out uh, into the new countries, taking the message of Christ in John's church, telling them, don't judge anybody. Every human being is a child of God and the Lord wants everybody to be saved. So do not look at any disadvantage that the person has. That's not a disadvantage at all. In fact, all the advantages that Nicodemus had were disadvantages. And St. Paul said that in his letter to the Philippians, that he now considers all the advantages that he had as a Pharisee uh, to be disadvantages because they kept him away from Christ for so long. So in actual fact, it's Nicodemus that's handicapped and not the woman. So let's do a tiny bit of revision before we go on. Jesus alone can provide the only birth that matters. So it actually doesn't matter where you were born. And it doesn't matter the way you were born. Because we can say that some children are born illegitimate. That's not going to make any difference to him. If you're alive, if you're a human being, you're a child of God, no matter what way you came here. Uh, and as the Word incarnate and as wisdom incarnate, Jesus alone can provide true knowledge of God. And he's going to give that directly to this woman and to the man whom he meets. We've already been told in chapter 2 that Jesus is the new temple uh, and that he is the place uh, where we will all have access to God. So the woman is going to hear that her problem about worshipping on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem, where she's not allowed to worship, is obsolete. It's past tense, that the Lord has moved on and done something completely new. Uh, and we did learn in chapter one, at the end of chapter one, that Jesus is the fulfillment of Jacob's ladder. So all commerce with God is through him, with him and in him as our one and only mediator. And we have learned also through John the Baptist that Jesus alone can give us the gift of the Spirit. So it doesn't matter whether you have advantages or disadvantages. All that matters is that you actually come to Jesus. So let's read another few verses. On the way, this is verse 5. Jesus came to a Samaritan town called Sychar. It was near the land that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired by the journey, sat straight down by the well. It was the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus opened the conversation and said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food and the Samaritan woman said, What? You a Jew? Ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? I'm going to stop there because we have a long journey to arrive back at that point. John loves giving us uh, uh, symbols and images that make us go back into the Old Testament and look for the foundations. And here we're going to meet uh, the flat water uh, of the cistern and the bubbling living water that Jesus is going to offer this woman. It's going to be actually quite important. So as far as Jesus is concerned, the old water of the old covenant is gone stale. We don't need it. There is a new water that's bubbling up to eternal life that Jesus is offering. And this woman, like anybody else, doesn't know where this water will come from. Uh, so he is going to have to uh, reveal it to her. Uh, so 
If you go back to the Synoptic Gospels, the choice that was given to the people of Israel was the old wine or the new wine. And we've already covered this, that many of them didn't want the new wine, they preferred the old wine. So the Synoptic Gospels deal with that. Uh, and Luke 5.39 tells us that anybody who's been drinking the old wine doesn't want the new. And that's exactly uh, the situation that Jesus actually met uh, among the Judeans. But here, when you come to the subject of living water, the Old Testament spoke quite a lot about living water. For example, uh, Proverbs 13.14 tells us that the wise man's teaching is a life-giving fountain. So they understood that if you went to the scriptures that were inspired by God himself, and that if you studied the scriptures and you took them to heart and you tried to live them, that you were imbibing this living water coming from God. Uh, and that wisdom itself imparted life to you. Uh, the prophet Isaiah chapter 55 verses one to three invites everyone to come and drink of this living water. Oh, come to the water, all you who are thirsty, though you have no money, come. Listen to me and you will have good things to eat. Pay attention to me, listen and your soul will live. Now that living water was coming from the scriptures, that you read and study and pray the scriptures and this living water of grace is actually given to you. The book of Sirach, chapter 24, verse 29 says that they who eat me will hunger for more and they who drink me will thirst for more. So knowing this about the Holy Scriptures, uh, we will uh, participate with Jesus as he reaches out to quench the thirst that is in the human race. Now, the thirst that's in the human race is the thirst for the infinite. It's a thirst for God. It's, it's a, a deep thing, deep within our being. And so when this conversation starts between Jesus and the woman, we're going to find that both of them are thirsty. He is thirsty for souls and she is thirsty for God. And when those two thirsts meet, something wonderful is going to happen. The water that Jesus is going to give uh, the teaching that Jesus will give is going to be so much at a higher level than the Old Testament that it's going to actually satisfy the soul. Okay, and so while Sirach would say, yes, you will hunger for more and you will thirst for more, that's not going to be the case with Jesus because Jesus' living water is the whole gift of salvation. And he's going to give us uh, we first of all have the living waters of the scriptures of the Old Testament. Then we have the living waters of the revelation of Jesus himself and of the Gospels. And then we have the grace that Jesus is pouring out for us to come into repentance and conversion. And then we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. The whole thing is this wonderful overflowing gift of God. And Jesus is the one who is, has come to dispense this wonderful gift from God. And we have to wait until chapter seven for Jesus to give us the invitation that we read in Isaiah, when Jesus will say in chapter seven, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Now we're going to see that this woman comes to Jesus, but uh, at what level is she coming to him? You see, there's different levels. Is she coming to a young man who is 30 years of age and he looks grand and he's out there in the open and he's available? Or is she coming to her saviour? There's different ways you can come to people. So Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And let the person come. If they come, let them actually drink. Because scripture says, out of their own hearts will flow fountains of living water. In other words, you will receive so much from him that you will have more than enough to give to everybody else. And John says, of course, that he was speaking of the gift of the Spirit that was going to be given after his resurrection. So this living water is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we 
come to this dialogue between Jesus and the woman. Let's come and look at what uh, we actually get in the text. Jesus opens the conversation. Now, why does Jesus open the conversation? It's because salvation comes from God's initiative. It's not from us. So he begins everything. But before we start the conversation, I want to say something quite shocking. And that is that if you go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 33 and verse 20, God the Father said to Moses, one of the greatest men who ever lived, and probably the greatest man among the chosen people. God said, you cannot see my face, for a man cannot see me and live. What we're going to see here is that this Samaritan woman who has all the disadvantages, who has no right, according to the Jewish people, to come into the presence of God, that she has a conversation with God face to face. God incarnate. It's an incredible thing. The I am not of the sinner meets the I am of God. This is the wonder that you're meeting with here. And I'll, I'll bring it out several times so that you kind of deal with it. Jesus is going to tell us in chapter five. You see, we have to go back and forward in John's gospel to try and understand the fullness of what we're dealing with at the time. In chapter five, he's going to say, as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so the son can give life to whoever he likes. And so here is this person who would not seem to be the right person to come at all, and yet the son will choose to give her life. It's absolutely amazing. And he also says in John 5.30, I don't come to do my own will. I come to do my father's will. Therefore, this dialogue that happens between Jesus and the woman is wanted by God the Father. And the revelation that is given to this woman and to all of us through this woman is actually wanted by God because Jesus will only do what his father wants. Uh, and the word, of course, tells us that Jesus came to save sinners. And if Jesus came to save sinners, he can't just go and approach saints because the saints don't need him. It's the sinners who need him. And as I've already told you in chapter two, that the problem about the temple of uh, God in Judea, in Jerusalem, was that God was hidden behind three veils. Nobody could approach his presence in any real sense. And what John is trying to get across to us is this. Uh, there's a whole lot of shocks here in, in this uh, chapter is that God has broken out of his maximum security prison in the temple and he says, I'm going to the people, you won't allow the people to come to me. They're my people. You mightn't like them. They may be your political enemies or your social enemies or your personal enemies or whatever, but they're my people. And so when we get to the second half of the gospel, the beloved disciples are going to discover we have no enemies. Everybody out there, no matter who they are, they are the children of God and they deserve to be given the living water of grace, the whole lot of them. So let's tell you about where Jesus went to. You're told in verse 5 that he went to a town called Sychar. Now, most of the scholars agree that this Sychar is the ancient Shechem, the place where Abraham landed before he became Abraham, when he landed in the land of Canaan for the first time. And he pitched his tent in Shechem, and it was beside a place called the Oak of More. And at the Oak of More, God the Father uh, came to Abraham in a vision and said, you can have all of this land, I will give it to your descendants. But the people living in this particular land now are Samaritans. They're not the original children of Abraham. And so the children of Abraham despise the people who are actually living here. 
it was in this place in Shechem that Abraham built his first altar to God. In Genesis 33, uh, when Jacob came back from living in Haran, which is in uh, modern day Syria, uh, he also came to this place, Shechem, now called Sikar. And he pitched his tent there and he also built an altar to God there. And for the people to survive at the time of the patriarchs, the patriarch had to dig a well to try and find water, otherwise the people couldn't stay there. And the well that uh, Jacob uh, built in this place is still famous to this very day. I myself have sat on the side of this well and looked down at the bubbling water still there at this very, very deep well. And so, the, the well of Jacob became one of the landmarks in the area. And uh, the landmark told everybody what territory they were actually in. And we're told also that Jacob had given this particular land to Joseph. And therefore the Samaritans are living in a very precious place, a place that's really sacred to Abraham and his children. Uh, it's just that their origin is unfortunate because at the time of the disintegration of Israel into two uh, kingdoms, the northern kingdom was eventually uh, sent out into exile into Assyria and they never came back. And they were replaced by five tribes. And these five tribes brought their own false gods with them. And after a few months of living in the land, you'll find this in 2 Kings 17. Uh, after a few months of living in the land, they began to be, become sick. And they sent a message back to the king of Assyria saying, the God of this land doesn't like us because we're getting sick. So they then had five idols and Yahweh. They had five husbands. The one you have now is not a husband. That's my introduction to our next session. I hope you will join us. Sloan Agus Bannock, they live. Goodbye. God bless you. The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel, the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope. The hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals, but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work.